RT-QPCR is, among other things, used to see how much of various proteins are being made or expressed in cells under different conditions or in different cell types. And so it does this by making DNA copies of the messenger RNA copies of the genes and then making DNA copies of those messenger of those DNA copies of the messenger RNA copies and then detecting those copies as they're being made. So that sounds really complicated, but it's really not that bad. And so let's go over both an overview as well as some of the technical details. First of all, you might be wondering, wait, RT-PCR, that's the thing that's used in the coronavirus test, right? Yes, so it's the same technique. Um, you're making DNA copies of RNA in the reverse transcription step. So in that case, you're making DNA copies of viral RNA. Um, and then in the PCR amplification and detection step, you're making DNA copies of those and, and measuring those copies. But so you can use it to detect viral RNA, but more commonly we're using it to detect messenger RNAs. Um, and so messenger RNAs are these intermediates between the permanent recipes for proteins, so the genes and the final um, protein product. And this messenger RNA intermediate, if we can detect the copy, so the cells make copies of this messenger RNA intermediate when they want to make more of the protein. So if you think of the chromosome has where it is the DNA it has all these genes. And so they're kind of like the original recipes. And you can imagine that your cells aren't going to want to use all those recipes at the same time. So just like a restaurant isn't going to want to make pancakes at night. Um, it's not like you. So if you, the restaurant say, you know, on the menu, they say like, breakfast only served till 10 or whatever. So if you go to the restaurant at 11, it's not like they suddenly don't have the recipe for making the, for making it. They're just, the chefs aren't being told to make it. And so how your, if you think of the protein chefs in your cells as being these ribosomes, how they're told to make various proteins is that the cell makes copies, messenger RNA copies. So they take this gene and then in this process of transcription, they make a messenger RNA copy of it. Well, first they make this pre-messenger RNA and then that gets processed. Um, the splicing is going to remove these regulatory introns. These regions are gonna be um, spliced together. These exons are the regions with the protein coding instructions. Um, and then it gets this cap in this tail. And then these messenger RNA, mature messenger RNA copies are given to the ribosomes to make proteins from them. So it's kind of like the restaurant Xeroxing copies of the recipe and then handing those out to the chefs. And you can imagine that the more recipes you have out there, the more opportunities there are for the protein to get made. So if we can measure these recipe RNA copies, then we can get an idea about how much of various proteins are getting made, and RT-QPCR lets us do this. So I should note that there are various levels, as I talked about in a post a couple of days ago, there's a lot of regulation that can go on both before and after the mRNA making step. And so this is just one way of studying like expression of a gene, um, and more on that in the other post. And we're going to be looking for specific messenger RNAs. So you might have heard of like RNA-seq and that's gonna sequence like all of the RNAs. Um, but with RTQPCR, we're looking for specific ones and seeing how much of them there are. And the way that we can tell how much of them that they are is by making copies of them. So at first there's not very much of this messenger RNA, even for a highly expressed gene, not enough to like detect easily. And so we need to make it detectable. So we need to make a lot of copies of it and we need to make those copies in a way that's gonna let us see this. Um, so first, what we're going to do is we're going, we're going to use PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which makes DNA copies from a DNA template. We have RNA, so we need to reverse transcribe it. So transcription, remember, is when we go from the DNA to the RNA. Reverse transcription is when we go from the RNA to the DNA. So we have to use a different enzyme, a different uh, reaction speeder upper mediator. So a reverse transcriptase, and it's going to make this complementary DNA. Um, so basically you have this mRNA strand and you make this, D C this DNA and we call this the cDNA strand or the complementary DNA. Then in the PCR step, we're going to take this DNA that we've made, this um, cDNA, and we're going to make copies of a region of it. Each cycle of PCR, you get a doubling. So quickly you're building up lots and lots of copies. 
which isn't very useful unless we can see those copies. And so with the um, with this QPCR, with this, um, you're going to be able to like count the recipes as they're, the copies as they're made. And this is gonna give you an idea of how much you started it with. So because you're growing exponentially, if though, if you started at like this step, you're gonna grow a lot, like you reach huge numbers more quickly than if you started at this step. And so we can basically set a threshold and then say, okay, well, how long does it take you to reach that threshold? And the more copies you start with, the faster you're going to cross this threshold. And we call this threshold where you're over the baseline, either like the CQ um, for like the quantification count, uh, cycle, so or CT for the threshold cycle. Um, you'll see those. So as, we'll, as I'll get into, we, we get to define the region that we want to the PCR to make copies of. And so we're going to use primers, these little short pieces of DNA that specify the region to be copied. We'll use primers that are actually going to be specific for the messenger RNA that we want to see, the, um, to see copied. This is why we can use it for um, like COVID-19 detection because we're making, we use primers that are going to tell the DNA copiers to make copies of viral, um, viral genetic sequences. But in this case, we're going to be telling it to make copies of whatever gene that we're, whatever messenger RNA that we're interested in. And I'll get more into the details of primer design later. Um, but this way, the copies, when you're making copies, they should all be, if you design your primers right and everything, all of the copies that you're making should be of the thing that you are actually looking for. But so therefore, if you were to just measure the double-stranded DNA formation, you would be able to get a sense of how much of your thing was getting made because theoretically only your thing should be getting copied. Um, and so this is the idea behind these double-stranded DNA binding dyes, commonly some sort of like cyber green type of thing. Um, and so this is one method that's used. However, it's um, less specific than reporter probes. Um, and so reporter probes, basically how these work is that you have these fluorescent probes that are going to bind the copies that you're making. These, um, it's gonna give it more specific, more specificity because now you're defining the region with the primers and with these, so the region that gets copied is defined by the primers. And then the probes are gonna provide another level of specificity on top of that because you divide, design these so that they're binding on the copied strands. Um, so you can do it, the probes can be like bound to other strand. Um, and so how these probes work is basically on one end is a fluorophore. So these, it's going to and basically a fluorophore is something that if it absorbs light at one wavelength and it's going to let off light at another wavelength. And what we're going to do is at the other end, we're actually going to have a quencher. Um, so this is going to use a concept called FRET or Forster Resonance Energy Transfer. So basically that light that's getting absorbed and the light that gets released, it's just energy. Um, so light is little packets of energy that travel in waves. Um, and so certain molecules have a chemical makeup that allows them to absorb light at different wavelengths. And so these different wavelengths correspond to those little packets of energy, these photons having different energies, energy levels. And when they match the molecule, then the molecule can absorb them. Um, and then this excites an electron in the molecule, but then that electron um, can't stay excited forever. And so it falls back down and it lets off light. Um, so it lets off that back out that energy that it had absorbed, but it's used up some of the energy and like vibrating and that sort of thing. Um, and so it's going to be a little lower wavelength. So it'll be a different, a lower energy, um, a different wavelength is the point. And so if you have a quencher, so a, a molecule that can absorb the wavelength that's given off by this, for, by the fluorophore. So if the quencher is nearby, then the fluorophore, even though it's giving off this energy, it's not giving it off as light because that energy is getting stolen by this quencher. But when the quencher is far away, now the, inner, the light can be given off. And so this is the idea when you have these um, probes is that the probes are binding in the region that just got copied. And then this pol the polymerase that we're using to so the DNA copier it actually has this five prime exonuclease activity. So five prime and three prime referring to the ends of the DNA. So you have one strand going five prime to three prime on this, like this, and then one strand going five prime to three prime like this. And then the polymerases always go five prime to three prime. 
Um, it's just based on the chemistry of the DNA molecules. And so what happens is, so it has five primes, this polymerase is like, has five prime to three prime um, exonuclease activity. So exonuclease, it's chewing from the ends of DNA. And the, um, so it's going to be chewing from the five prime end. So basically when it runs into this probe, it can chew it up. And when it chews it up, it's gonna separate the fluorophore and the quencher. When they come apart, then you're gonna see the light that's given off by the fluorophore. So if you shine the right wavelength that this fluorophore likes, then you're gonna see light given off. And you can measure this. And the more copies you have, the more this is gonna happen. And so your signal is going to rise. So at first, your, so your signal is going to be rising exponentially because in PCR, how it works is that each cycle, you basically, you melt, so you separate the strands and then you anneal, so you lower the temperature so the strands, the primers can bind, and in this case, your probes would be binding as well. Um, so that, that was the first cycle when you're defining the region, um, but then after here, you have your defined region, and so your primers are going to bind in the anneal step and your probe then you're going to make a copy, then you're gonna melt, so you're gonna separate the strands, then find things again and make a copy. So each time you're making a copy, um, you're doubling the amount. And so you should be doubling your fluorescent signal. But at first you start with a really small amount, and so you're not gonna see a high, um, high fluorescence. But at, once you start getting higher in numbers, now you're gonna reach the, the detection value or, or like you're going to start being able to detect it and then it's going to start rising really fast. So if you have just like background, um, you're gonna have just like some noise back here and it's not, it might, so it might reach some um, above this like threshold value, but not until like later on, really, really, really high cycle numbers. Um, but if you have something where you start with a lot, you're gonna reach, um, you're gonna pass this threshold that we defined late earlier. So the more copies you have, the more like left shifted things are gonna be. Um, and so basically, eventually it's gonna start running out um, at, so out of things. So it's gonna plateau, it's gonna run out of probes, it's gonna run out of primers, it's gonna run out of, it's gonna run out of something. So you're gonna get this plateau and you're not just gonna have fluorescence increase forever. Um, but you are going to have it. Um, that's why we define this like threshold value and see where it is where things cross this threshold so that we can then be able to compare things. Speaking of comparisons, you'll normally do like uh, some sort of normalization gene as well as your gene of interest um, or your mRNA of interest, some like thing that's expressed similarly in all of these cell types. It's best to do several. So people do things like app actin, um, GAP-DH, ribosomal um, RNAs, various things um, that are expressed similarly in different cells under all conditions and that sort of thing. So you can kind of normalize between samples. So if you see, okay, well now I have a really low CT count. So I have, a or CQ, you can see them both terms used. If I have a really low CQ, then that's basically saying that, oh, I started with a lot of copies. But if you start with a sample that has a lot more cells, then you're going to um, be like, that's going to be like artificial. And so you want to have some turn of internal normalization. Um, and that can come from those normalization controls, those like endogenous controls, those various terms that are used. One of the benefits of using the probes, which I, which I forgot to mention before, is that you can use probes with different fluorophores. Um, and this allows you to like multiplex. So if you basically your fluorophores recognize different wavelengths, then what you can do is you can actually stick in different, um, you can stick different, um, you can have different probes with different fluorophores for different genes, and then you can mix them all together and run them in the same reaction. Um, and this can be a, one of those ways where you can have those um, kind of those normalization controls actually in the same reaction as your own, um, as your own um, gene of interest or your own messenger RNA of interest. Um, and so that we'll get more into the various things about that. Um, and just a note, so with the fluor with the um, double-stranded RNA binding, you don't have the extra level of specificity that was offered up by having those probes. So when you have these probes, you have this extra layer of specificity. 
Um, and so you have the specificity defined by your primers and then the specificity defined by your probe. If you are just using the um, double-stranded RNA DNA binding dye, typically these dyes, um, so these dyes are just gonna like, typically they're intercalators, so they're basically going to go in between um, the strands of the DNA, or they might bind in the minor groove of the DNA, um, but they're just going to bind to the DNA non-specifically and let off some light um, that we can see if we shine the wavelength at them. So when we get more into talking about like primer design, it could be an issue if you have primers that are going to basically form like primer dimers. And so the primers can actually like bind to copies of itself or to the other primer. And if it does so in a way that can then get amplified, you're gonna get these little short pieces of DNA. Um, and so this double stranded DNA. And so this is gonna be a problem if we're trying to, um, if we're only detecting double stranded DNA and not specific double stranded DNA. There are things that you can do um, to kind of control for this. And so one of these is that these primer copies, like these like primer dimer copy things, they're gonna be small. When you do your experiment, you're gonna design the primers so that your sequence to be copied, the amplicon is gonna be like a hundred-ish. Um, and so those primer dimers are gonna be a lot shorter. When you have a longer piece of DNA, it's going to be harder to, you're gonna to have to get it hotter for those strands to come apart because you have more like stickiness together. Um, you have a longer region that's stuck together. So it's um, harder to pull apart. So you have to raise it to higher temperatures in, in order to get it to like melt. And so if you do like a melting curve analysis, so basically the, the, these double-stranded DNA binding dyes are only gonna bind to double-stranded DNA. So when those DNA strands come apart, when they melt, then you're gonna get this single-stranded and you're not gonna have the dye binding the same. So you can measure after you do all of your PCR things, you can do a melting curve analysis where basically you take the DNA and then you start heating it up and you see how, how hot you have to get it in order for the strands to come apart. Um, and then your signal will, you'll get the change in the signal um, in the fluorescence because of the dye. And so if you get that change really early, then that's telling you that those, you were probably detecting like primer dimers, short little things. Whereas if you get your change later, then this can correspond to a longer product that's hopefully your product. But you still don't have the specificity quite, you don't have the specificity, you just know that it's something that's longer. Um, and that's why it's really important that with like you have good primer design, and we'll get more into that in a minute. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Um, so, but so we have to, we're going to be copying DNA, not RNA. So, first we have to make RNA um, through reverse transcription. Um, so, thankfully, we can do this because DNA and RNA, um, their bases can base pair with one another, which is so we can have, this is why we, our cells, we can have. Um, we can like replicate our whole genome, so our DNA genome using a DNA dependent DNA polymerase. And this is also what we're gonna do in PCR um, where we're making DNA copies of DNA. We can also make RNA copies of DNA, but using a DNA dependent RNA polymerase. And this is what's done in the transcription step in our cells. And then what we do before we do the PCR is we do reverse transcription. And so this is using an RNA dependent DNA polymerase. So we're making DNA copies of RNA um, and we, and we need to do this so that we can then do the PCR step. So we need to isolate this RNA. So often how this is done is with like a trizole or like a phenylchloroform extraction. Um, and the basic idea is that you're separating out the RNA um, selectively by using, um, kind of manipulating the solutions it's in to get it to precipitate and wash everything off out, off, else off and then, um, so th there's also ways like column-based methods and various things. But the key is that you get that um, RNA and now we need to make the DNA copies of it because it's these DNA copies that we're gonna use in this PCR step. Um, and so we need to basically isolate that. So we isolated the RNA, but we have the total RNA. Now we have to make DNA copies of the RNA and we have to make a choice. So we can either, because the messenger RNA should all have that um, poly A tail, except for like some weird like histone genes and that sort of thing. 
So we can use all Oligo DT primer. So Oligo is like short piece. Um, and so we have basically like a short piece of deoxythymidine. So we have the DNA letter T. So if our primer is, so the primer remembers what's going to tell the polymerase where to start. And if we use an Oligo DT primer, it's going to make cDNA of all tailed mRNA. Um, but it can also make copies of parts of RNAs that just happen to have a lot of A's somewhere. Um, and it can also start anywhere in the tail. Um, so you might waste a lot of resources and energy amplifying the generic part. So if you start at a, the end of a really, really long tail um, and then you start making all of these copies and then it might run out of steam before it even gets to your gene. Um, and so then we don't want that to happen. So one strategy that can be used is to use anchored oligo DTs. And so basically they have a string of Ts, but then they also have a, um, they have like a letter at the end. So they have one of the four letters. So you put in like ones with A's, ones with C's, ones with G's, ones with T's. And then these are going to bind. So you have the T's. And then if there is a whatever letter is next here, basically you're going to have it bind so that they're only going to start at the beginning of the tail. Um, but they won't make any copies of non-tailed RNA. So because we can use this technique for detecting different types of RNA, such as we saw with the in the case of our viral RNA, because of this, if something doesn't have like a poly A tail, it won't be detected, but we can still use different types of primers in order to detect those. Um, and so even if, so random primers will, so often you use like hexmers. Um, so basically just like random six letter sequences. And these can serve as primers and that because you have these, this mix of these random things, it's such a short enough, those sequences are likely to occur somewhere in like all of the genes, all of the messenger RNAs, all of the everything. So this will like amplify like everything type sort of thing. Um, but it could be a problem if you have, if it's not amplifying the region of your thing where you're actually wanting to see things. So you can end up with like a lot of little like weird short pieces corresponding to different parts of different genes. The a benefit with using a uh, end is that you're going to basically have guaranteed that you have this end unless you're amplifying like a really long tail. Um, but you'll have the end of the D the five prime end or the three prime end of the DNA. And so if you wanted the three prime end, um, if you have something, you need to basically design your probe so that your primers and your probes so that you're actually detecting some region down here. If you have some place that's like, if your primers and probes are de designed to detect some region all the way up here, then you might not reach all the way there. Um, so often what people do is they actually use like a, a mix of random primers and um, Oligo DT or these anchored Oligo DTs. Um, so different strategies in order to try to amplify as best as they can. So if you have the Oligo DT, you're more likely to kind of keep in the things, the rarer messenger RNAs that you might be losing if you don't, um, if you just use random primers. Um, oh, the other thing I should mention when we're talking about reverse transcription primers is that you can also use primers that are specific for your gene of interest. So we'll talk about how we're going to make our primers for the PCR step that are specific for our gene of interest, but we can also use make primers that are specific for the cDNA step as well. Um, because in the cDNA step, um, if we, then we can like basically only make copies of ours at this point. The problem is that you can then only make copies of the one you want for, so you have to do different reactions for different genes that you would want. Um, by doing all of the RNA, then you have the opportunity to test that same sample of cDNA for lots of different genes, as opposed to having to test different RNA batches for different genes. Um, and so there's a bit more control.
but with when you're using the single gene, you can also do things like a one step reaction where you're doing basically the reverse transcription and the CD. Uh, so like the cDNA synthesis, the second, and then the PCR at like the same in the same tube type of thing, as opposed to doing the cDNA synthesis and then separating that and adding different um, different primer probe mixes. Um, but you're all, there's benefits and drawbacks to each of the different techniques. And I encourage you to check out some of the resources I'll point you to um, that are more like adept at this sort of thing. So basically, I remember how I said how the messenger RNA copies that get made actually get edited a little. And so we talked about the cap and the tail, um, but also the splicing. And so these introns, these, regula these like regulatory regions are gonna get spliced out um, in this process called splicing. So basically that information is important for telling the, the like transcription factors, telling the polymerases and stuff in the nucleus, like when should I make messenger RNA copies? But then those regions, we need to get rid of those copies because that region is going to be not make any sense to the ribosome and it's gonna make nonsense. This, this can actually, the splicing can actually happen in different ways. We call this like alternative splicing. Um, and so it's important that you kind of know what, you look into your gene. So there are various software that you can use and stuff. Um, Blast is a lot of information. RefSeq, um, you wanna basically see what exons are normally getting spliced together. And if there's exons that, if there are like alternative spice products that could like mess things up for you if you don't know about them in advance. And maybe you're, you can use this to like detect a specific splice product if that's what you're interested in. But if you want to detect like all the splice products, you're going to want to use like a combination um, that is shared between them. And you're also going to want to use something with like a long intron, not something where the introns are really close together. Because what you want to do is you want to avoid actually amplifying on the whole point with like this using int using um, amplifying a region that crosses an exon exon junction is so that you're not amplifying the pre messenger RNA and more importantly you're not messaging like the mess you're not copying the genomic DNA. Um, so there's actually some pr some processes you actually use like a DNA an RNA step or use a DNA step so basically you chew away any of the DNA, um, but you can still have some DNA contamination. And this can be a problem if you have genomic DNA in there, because as we see with the PCR, you're going to be making lots of lots of copies exponentially. So even if you start with just a little bit of that DNA, you can copy a lot of it. And so basically, if you have the, you have your primer, so you have one primer out here. So maybe it's a primer that crosses a junction, or maybe it's just starts in one and goes into, um, and it'll copy this one. And then you have a primer over here that starts over here and copies this way. If you have a really long intron in here, you're, with your PCR cycles, you only set it, you set this cycle, um, you set like these cycle limits so that you are, Amplify, set it like so that it gets the polymerase time to copy the size of your amplicon, which is typically around 100 ish. Um, and so if you have this like thousand ish intron, then your polymerase is not going to make a complete copy of this. And so this isn't going to get amplified if the intron is still in there. But if the intron is removed, if it's been spliced out, now you have the size length that you anticipated and you get this product that you would expect to get. So by designing your primers so that they're going, um, so that they're spanning an intron exon junction um, or spanning an exon like exon junction, then you can basically make sure that that is not happening. So when we're designing those primers, there's some things that we want to keep in mind. And so we have to keep in mind the basic things that we keep in mind for any PCR. Um, and so we don't want to have um, them be too GC rich. Um, we don't want them to bind to themselves or to the other primer because then we'll get those primer dimer problems we talked about. And even though in if you're using like probe based reporters, then you're not going to have to worry about detecting this little product. You're still wasting a bunch of your primer and a bunch of your resources um, in order to make these primer dimers. Um, and this can be impeding the process of the PCR process. Um, so you don't want this to happen. You don't want to bind itself and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of software tools that you can use to help um, analyze this sort of thing. And you want to make sure that it's not going to bind to other places. Um, and so you may want to make sure it's really specific for your gene of interest um, and not going to bind to other places in the DNA um, so that you can um, then have problems. And the, here again is where having that probe can help 
um, so that if some re other region is amplified, if you use just like a double-stranded DNA binding dye, then you would see signal. But if you using a probe, then you also have to it wouldn't the probe wouldn't bind, wouldn't have double strand, wouldn't have DNA to bind to in between, and then you wouldn't see the signal. So that's another benefit of the probe-based approach. Of course, the drawback of the probe-based approach is cost. Um, no matter what type, with both the primer and the probe. So with the probe, we can design it to bind to either strand because we're going to be making both strands in the PCR step. With the primer design, so we need to basically be making primers. So with the cDNA primers, if we're using a specific, if we're using a specific gene, a specific gene-specific primer for our cDNA synthesis, we need to make sure we're using the reverse complement. Um, and then later we'll need one from the from the reverse complement and one from the non. And so we need to talk about this terminology. And so we can, we talk about five prime and three prime as being like the two ends of the DNA. So the five prime end has a free phosphate group, five prime prostate. The three prime end has a free three prime OH. And this is going to allow them to add together. And so when the polymerase is going along, it's going to be working five prime to three prime. So it can only work five prime to three prime. It's not going to go three prime to five prime. Don't ask it to. And so basically, we need to give it a primer that's going to be directed to the right, directed the right way. So we're going to need a primer that's going to bind to each of these two strands and then copy the region between them. Because these strands are anti parallel, so you have five prime to three prime and then three prime to, so five prime to three prime and then five prime to three prime. So it's going to look like one is five prime to three prime and one is three prime to five prime when you're seeing it like this. By convention, we write five prime to three prime and the polymerase goes five prime to three prime. So because these strands are anti-parallel to one another, they're running in different directions. We have this specific base pairing relationships where we have A across from T, G across from C. Um, and this is what allows us to have to design a primer that will bind to one strand and copy the other strand. This is a specific pair to pair base pairing, um, letter to letter base pairing. But because it's anti-parallel, then you have the, so the complement would just be if this was like, so we would say like C is complementary to G. But when we were writing the sequence, instead of writing it, for, so the complement would be if it was like three prime to five prime, but we need the five prime to three prime ordering of it. So this is the reverse complement. So the reverse complement is going to make a copy of your like sense strand um, in, so we need this reverse complement if you're using the, um, a gene specific cDNA primer. It needs to be the reverse complement. So you're making a copy of the version of the mRNA that's actually used. So when that mRNA is used, made, only one strand is going to be used as a template to make the mRNA copy of this like coding strand. Um, so you need basically, you need the version of your primer that's going to bind to um, this way and go this way because it's going to be on the other strand. So it's going five prime to three prime, even though this strand is going five prime to three prime this way. So basically the terminology can get kind of confusing um, and you just wanna make sure that you have the right primers. Um, so you're not gonna, your primer for your, for that step is not going to be exactly the sequence. It's going to be the reverse complement and matching to the, um, to the three prime on the three prime um, of whoever you wanna copy. But when you're making, the, then you need to make your primers for the PCR step. When you make your primers for the PCR step, you're going to need one for each strand because you need one for each strand to specify where the polymerase needs to start on either strands. So the PCR, um, so you need a primer for each strand. And so there are various software tools that you can use, but basically one of these primers is going to match one end, one strand, and one of the primers is going to match the other strand and make a copy of the other strand. And so I will point you to some resources that you can use to help design these things, but it's really important to make sure that you're designing your primers in a way that's actually going to give you the product that you think that you're trying to get. In terms of how you do this in practice, typically you have some sort of master mix. Um, so it has, like, this is the only constant part. And so this post, sorry, this is one, I was doing it for um, the coronavirus testing. So that's why it has this like viral RNA type of things, um, but it's the same concept. So we have this master mix 
um, which is the constant part. And it's going to have a reverse transcriptase that's going to make a DNA copy of the RNA. And then it's going to have a DNA polymerase that's going to make DNA copies of that viral of that RNA. So this would be for like a one step reaction where you're making the DNA and the R, your DNA copies of the same reaction, as opposed to the two steps we're talking about where you make these, you make the cDNA and then you make the DNA in like separate steps. But um, so you would have like different master mixes. The idea with a master mix is it has like basically all the stuff that stays constant in the various reactions. So it has the enzyme that you would need and it has like the DNA letters, the salts, et cetera. Um, so remember, you have a different master mixes if you're doing the steps separately. Then you can, but the basic idea is that you want to do all of the, you want to minimize how much pipetting and stuff you have to do. So you saw there's like 96, well, um, there's 96 tube plate things. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of pipetting involved and we want to minimize the pipetting um, both for consistency's sake and for our thumb's sake. Um, so by using a master mix, we can basically do that. And so we can often buy the, the companies will sell the master mixes and stuff. Um, and then we can have for each of our samples, we'll have like a primer probe mix. Um, and then you'll have your test samples. Um, and so you also have controls. So you want to have some sort of positive control, hopefully, um, which is just like a region of the gene genetic sequence that you want to have copied you have some sort of like synthetic dna or whatever you can have this ordered from a company um that for kind of like how you order primers except this or you'd order um but this case you order like a really big piece of dna or like in a plasmid or something um so basically you just have some sort of positive control to make sure that everything's working okay and then you want to have a negative control where it's just water um so you make sure there's not any sort of contamination um and that sort of thing. Um, and then typically you'll have samples under different conditions. Um, so maybe with and without a drug, maybe with um, different times of the day and their different stress, not stress, different cell types, various things. And then by having the normalization, then you can kind of compare between the two. So you can get an idea about which genes are getting expressed more or less than others under different at different times, that sort of thing. Um, and so you have with qPCR, it's one of the me key methods that we use when we're measuring like gene expression, um, but it is by sure not alone. And because you have to basically define which ones you're detecting, you are not getting the full picture of what's going on because there could be a lot of other genes that are having differential expression under those conditions, but you're not detecting them. Um, and that's where like RNA seq can come in, where you basically make a copy of all of the RNAs. But there are different um, benefits and drawbacks of all of these techniques, including various biases that come into play with the various techniques, where some RNAs might be detected better than others for no fault of their own. Um, and so we have a variety of different techniques, and RTQPCR is a very a very prominent one. Um, with any of these techniques, remember too that it's not just mRNA is only one part of the picture. You can also have differences um, in translation and even post-translational modification. Um, so there's various levels of regulation that are going on. Um, and the by measuring the messenger RNA levels, we can get an idea of the expression at this level. Um, and because this technique is looking at just its it's designed to look at like um, just a genetic sequence. So if you do RNA or you can even just start with the DNA, but the basic idea is that you can count whatever you want. And so it doesn't have to be messenger RNA. It can be viral RNA, or it can even be non-coding RNA. So things that don't, that basically go through transcription, but then they function as an RNA level and not at the protein level. We can make copies of that. We can also use primers to like detect different splice variants. Um, so if you design it to span a certain exon exon junction that's only in some splice variants, then you can see differences in the splice variants. So this technique has a lot of uses, and I hope this video helped um, clarify some confusion, maybe um, help you design your experiments. Um, yeah, so basically hope that helped.